Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone and welcome to this lesson. In this lesson, we are going to learn an important helminthic infection. The helminthic infections, though their prevalence has overall come down, but they form an important differential diagnosis for pyrexia of unknown origin or some other clinical diagnosis. Hence, it is important to learn some of these common helminthic infection. Let us begin today's class. The objectives of today's class are that at the end of the lesson, we all will be able to understand what is this particular helminthic infection, what are the characters of the parasite causing this infection and its laboratory diagnosis. To meet the objectives of this lesson, we are going to discuss topic under following headings. The helminthic disease its prevalence, its clinical features, complication, treatment, prevention, etc., the details of the parasite and its laboratory diagnosis. So, let us take the example of two case scenarios which will help us to understand in a better way. The first case here, this man came to us with a history of swelling of the limbs which was gradual and progressive over the years and it became to such an extent that the patient was having disfiguration as well as huge swelling of the lower limbs. He also had initially fever with chills and rigors. In this case, we collected his blood sample. It was collected in the night around 1 o'clock and the peripheral smear was made and it was stained with the Jimsa stain. We could see the microfilaria, the peripheral smear. These microfilaria we are seeing are the sheathed microfilaria. We can see the sheath covering this particular larval form. This is case number 1. There was another case on examination, the clinical diagnosis was inguinal hernia and lymphadenitis inflammation in the area. In this case, the lymph node biopsy was done and the tissue smear was made and stained by Jimsa stain again. We could see here the cross section of the adult worms in this particular case. So, we have taken into consideration two cases which exhibited the presence of the larva and the adult worms of one particular parasite. I hope you are already guessing the diagnosis here. So, what do you think is a clinical diagnosis? Yes, you are right, it is filariasis. This is a disease of lymphatics and subcutaneous tissues. Adult worms of this parasite are going to reside for many years in the lymphatics and they clog the lymphatics ultimately affecting the drainage of that part leading to inflammation, thickening and swelling which we observe which is called as elephantiasis. Having discussed the work of the cases, let us now learn about details of the disease as well as the parasite causing this particular infection. Coming to the epidemiology of this disease, 14 crore people all over the world have thought to be affected with this disease out of which 8 crore are particularly affected by common parasite among the group that is Ucheraria bancrofti. Rest all are not very common. This disease is found in tropical India, China, Africa, South and Central America. There is a vector Culex 
mosquito which transmits the disease. There are different species of this parasite which affect human beings. Uchereria bancrofti as I said is the commonest one. Brugia malai is the next common one. Both of them they produce a disease which we considered in our two cases that is filariasis that is called as the Bancroftian filariasis. The other two are less important however, sometimes we come across these cases Oncocerca volvulus which causes river blindness or Oncocerciasis, Loa Loa also affects the eye. The others particularly Mansonella perstans are not usually going to affect human beings. Uchereria bancrofti is the common species we come across. It exhibits itself in three different morphological forms. The adult forms, microfilaria and the larval forms. The next level microfilaria are L1, L2, L3 larvae. The adult female of Uchereria measures about 8 to 10 centimeters and which is located in the lymph nodes and the afferent lymphatics. They may be present in the retroperitoneal or renal lymphatics which are commonly observed. Adult males measure about 2 to 4 centimeters in length by 0.1 millimeter in diameter. As we are seeing here female adult worm is longer compared to the male and there are few other morphological differences between male and the female adult worms. They reside in the lymph nodes and they grow to adult forms then the male fertilizes female then they start producing microfilaria or they start uh, releasing the microfilaria into the efferent lymphatics. Friends after having learnt about the epidemiology of this disease we shall now consider the morphology. Uchereria bancrofti exists in three different morphological forms adult microfilaria and larvae. These are slender long organisms. The adult female is much longer than male. It may measure in length wise up to 8 to 10 centimeters and the adult male is up to 2 to 4 centimeters. They exist in the lymphatics in human beings. Let us now consider the important diagnostic form that is microfilaria measures somewhere from 200 to 300 micrometers. It is important to differentiate the species of filarial parasites. There are two points which we can consider to differentiate the species especially between Uchereria bancrofti and Brugia malai. Uchereria bancrofti species are sheathed microfilariae as you see here are sheathed parasites. Whereas the Brugia malai will not find the sheath around parasite. Another point which we can remember to differentiate the species is the presence of nuclei. These are the nuclear cells you are seeing here in Uchereria bancrofti. We see the tail tip free of nuclei. They are stopping much before the tail end of this parasite. Whereas the nuclei are present till the tail end in case of Brugia malai. After having learned the morphology, let us learn about the life cycle. Learning the life cycle of Uchereria bancrofti is important because once we understand the details of life cycle, we can go in even for better therapeutic approach. It also helps us in collection of the sample in the right time. Coming to the life cycle, Uchereria bancrofti completes its life cycle in two different host, definitive host and the intermediate host. Man is the definitive host because the adult worms exist in man and the sexual reproduction takes place here. The intermediate host is mosquito. Here the larval development takes place that is the asexual reproduction. Coming to the life cycle in man, infective forms are the L3 larvae. L3 larvae are going to be injected into the human skin when the mosquito especially the Culex mosquito bites human beings while taking its blood meal. These larvae L3 larvae enter into our skin, they enter into the subcutaneous tissues and further go into the lymphatics. 
they locate in the lymphatics and within 3 to 12 months they start multiplying into adult parasites. The adult uh, parasites reproduce and they release the microfilaria. You can see the microfilaria here. The microfilaria are further going to enter into the efferent lymphatics through the thoracic duct they enter into the circulation. They may be present in large numbers in the circulation and that is a time when the blood meal is taken by mosquito. This is a part of development in man. Let us now consider what happens in the mosquito once it picks up the microfilariae. The next step is unsheathing of microfilariae takes place. They shed their sheath and they enter into the gut and further go to the thoracic muscles in the mosquito. At the same time they get matured from L1 to L3 forms. From thoracic muscles they enter into the proboscis of mosquito and that is where we see completely matured L3 larvae which are ready to infect the next host when mosquito continues to take its blood meal. An important point to remember is the feeding habit of Culex mosquitoes they are nocturnal in nature. The microfilaremia or the release of microfilaria into circulation also takes place in the night time that is from 10 pm to 4 am. This is the time when the blood meal is taken by the mosquitoes and they take the microfilaria into them and this is how the life cycle continues. Friends after having learnt Bucheraria bancrofti life cycle it is important to learn its pathogenesis. Pathogenesis not only helps us to give clues about therapeutic measures to be taken against the disease as well as it will help us to devise new drugs or the vaccines against this. What are the forms which are important in initiating the inflammation? Chronic inflammation is set up in this disease. They are not the microfilaria which are pathogenic but they are the adult worms which are the pathogenic forms. Live adult worms as well as the dead adult worms are important as long as adult worms are live and multiplying in the lymphatics they keep the lymphatics patent and that is the reason we do not see presentation of the disease up till 3 to 4 years. Once the adult worms die they block the lymphatics. The live adult worms not only cause irritation they release the toxic substances which adds up to the inflammatory damage resulting into lymphangitis, lymphadenitis and non-pitting edema. The edema is also typically described here as the brawny edema. When the dead adult worms block the lymphatics that also sets up enhanced granulomatous reaction in the tissues leading to fibrosis, dilatation and thickening of afferent lymphatics that is how chronic and slowly progressive thickening of the skin takes place which we call as elephantiasis or hydrocele. Friends now let us learn the clinical features. Learning the clinical features will not only help us in the diagnosis but also helps us in but also helps us in considering the differential diagnosis. Most of the time the patient may be asymptomatic even if there is a heavy microfilaremia, we may not find any symptoms in the patient as I have already said they are non-pathogenic forms. But when the adult worms are present in large numbers in the afferent and efferent lymphatics, they are going to lead to lymphatic dysfunction and lymphatic edema. Lymph stasis or blockage will result into elephantiasis, frequently the lower limbs are involved here. Hydrocel and scrotal enfantiasis is also the presenting forms. Depending upon the site of involvement, patient may also present with chyluria, chylothorax, chyloacitis or chylus diarrhea. As we know the other species can cause onchocerciasis, it may result into river blindness. Loasis can be another presentation wherein there can be eye involvement and episodic angioedema, calabar swellings are the typical presentations of loasis. 
there is one more clinical presentation which is typically called as pulmonary tropical eosinophilia syndrome. Microfilaria may not be present in the circulation, they are hidden that is the reason we call this pre particular presentation as the occult filariasis. Occult filariasis is nothing but the hypersensitive reaction to the filarial antigens. Microfilaria are trapped in the alveoli and there is eosinophilic infiltration along with other inflammatory exudate. Patient presents with fever, cough, weight loss and wheezing especially in the night. On examination the patients may have lymphadenopathy, eosinophilia, increased antifilarial antibodies and high serum IgE levels. On the chest x-ray we may find mortal lung opacities. This is a typical presentation in case of tropical pulmonary eosinophilia syndrome. As of now we have covered details of the disease and the details of the causative agent particularly Bucheraria bancrofti, the morphological forms, life cycle and the pathogenesis. Now let us consider the detailed laboratory workup in such cases. How do we go for lab diagnosis of filariasis? We will consider it under microscopy culture and serological technique. There are different steps of lab diagnosis available. We can demonstrate the microfilaria in the peripheral blood. We can demonstrate the adult worms in the lymphatics and the tissues. We can also go for some serological tests which are although non-specific they can be of some help when there is antigens as well as antibodies can be demonstrated. There are some molecular tests as well. Let us take one by one the steps of lab diagnosis. First and the foremost is demonstration of microfilaria. Microfilarial forms act as the diagnostic forms. They can be very well demonstrated in the peripheral blood. We can either go in for the wet mount examination or we can examine them after staining the peripheral smear. This is the direct examination. If the number of microfilaria are lesser sometimes then we can go for concentration techniques. The wet mount examination of capillary blood, the blood should be collected from the capillary, venous bl blood is not usually suggested. To collect the capillary blood we usually choose ear lobes as the site for puncture. The common stains which are done are gymsa and field stain. The concentration techniques are capillary blood centrifugation, venous blood centrifugation or venous blood filtration. Sometimes when the blood is collected in the wrong time, we may not be able to demonstrate microfilaria in the peripheral smear. One particular test which is called as the DEC provocation test that is diethyl carbamazine provocation test. This is a compound which is given 100 milligram orally 35 to 40 minutes prior to collection of blood and made the smear then it is going to yield the better results because the DEC is going to provocate the release of microfilaria into circulation. Even if it, even though it is not a night time, the drug is going to provocate the female adult worm to release the microfilaria into circulation and that is how we will be able to demonstrate them under the microscope. Peripheral smear as we already saw in two of our cases that show the presence of microfilaria and as I already said that the tip of the microfilaria very helpful in differentiating between the species. Uchereria bancrofti is going to have the nuclei stopping little away from the tail tip. This is one of the characteristic feature and also one most important thing is these microfilaria of Uchereria bancrofti are sheathed parasites. We can see the sheath here, we can see it here as well. Sometimes we can demonstrate the adult worms although the lymph node biopsy is not really indicated. When we fail to demonstrate the microfilaria we can go in for the tissue smear which might show us the presence of adult worms after staining them with either HND fields or gymsa stain. These 
were the uh, test which we actually used to demonstrate either the adult worm or the microfilaria in the tissues or in the peripheral blood. There are some serological techniques though they are non-specific there can be cross reaction with the other helminthic parasites as well, but sometimes we can adopt these techniques as well. The important test in this group available are passive hemagglutination test, fluorescent antibody test or the ELISA test. They may either demonstrate the antigen or the antibody rise microfilarial antigens. Another mode of diagnostic facility available are the molecular techniques especially the PCR is the diagnostic technique which will help us to detect even if there are few circulating antigens present in the tissues or in the blood. So, we have covered the lab diagnosis of filariasis mainly through demonstration of microfilaria, adult worms, serological and molecular technique coming to the treatment. Treatment is diethyl carbamazine which is the drug of choice. It is given 6 milligrams per kg per day. It can be given for a long term. Other modalities available are if the patient has already had the complications of filariasis like the hydrocele or inguinal hernia then he needs the surgical intervention. Patient may be benefited by venous shunting or in case of edema of the limbs foot end elevation might help or elastic rape bandage are some of the other things which will help in recovery. How do we go for prevention of these diseases? It is a vector bound disease. So, vector control is a very important step what we need to take. We know that one larva which is entering the human being through the bite of the mosquito is just going to get converted into one adult worm only. because the larva are not going to multiply inside the human beings. Sometimes we see severe infection, how is this possible? It is possible through the bite of multiple mosquitoes as we should remember that there is no multiplication of the larvae which is going to take place inside the human beings. Also the vector control is important because there is no animal reservoir. Another thing what we can do is mass treatment with diethyl carbamazine in the communities. These are some important measures what we can take to prevent the disease. So, till now we have covered this lesson under three headings the details of the filariasis, the parasite causing that is Bucheraria bancrofti in detail and the laboratory diagnosis. By doing this I hope we have met the lesson objective. We have understood the helminthic infection, parasite characteristics and the laboratory diagnosis. These are references for the pictures which have been used in this lesson. Thank you very much.